let's take a look at the photoelectric effect and electron diffraction. Now when we talk about the photoelectric effect, we are going to imagine a situation where we have a metal plate, and then we're going to have a light source. And the light source is going to send in pretty intense light waves or electromagnetic waves uh, toward the metal plate. So they're going to carry energy into the metal plate. And if you do this, um, you'd expect that you can eject electrons from the metal plate, right? You send energy in through these electromagnetic waves, and then it's absorbed by the material, and the energy comes out with these electrons that carry kinetic energy as they fly away from the plate. And this has been observed for quite a while, and the old or classical expected result is that if you send in a lot of light energy, then you'd get a lot of energetic electrons coming out or ejected from the metal, right? You send energy in with the electromagnetic waves, and you'll get energy out with the kinetic energy of these ejected electrons. But this is not exactly what is observed if you do this experiment. Instead, what is observed is that only high frequency light can eject the electrons. Even if you send in a huge amount of low frequency light carrying a huge amount of energy, if it's low frequency light, no electrons are ejected. Also, the energy of the ejected electrons is proportional to the frequency of the light, not the amount of energy that you send in. So this was not what we would expect. We would expect that if you send more energy in, you get more energy out. But there's also a frequency component to it. If you send in low frequency light, if it's below a certain threshold, no electrons come out, even if you send in a huge amount of energy. And also, the energy of those ejected electrons is proportional to the frequency of the light, not the amount of energy that you send in. So this was explained by Einstein in the early 20th century, and this is how he earned a Nobel Prize. He explained it by saying that light can be described as photons. Now we've seen this idea of photons before, but this is one of the origins of it. So these photons are described as bundles or packages of energy, where the energy of the photon is equal to hf where h is Planck's constant and f is the frequency of light. And he also said that there is a threshold frequency, we'll call it f0 or f0, and below that threshold frequency, no electrons are ejected from the metal. And the reason why is to eject an electron from the metal, it requires a certain amount of energy to go in. You require a certain amount of energy to eject an electron. And that amount of energy to eject the electron is called the work function. It's represented by the capital letter phi. And if the photon has less energy than this, than this work function, then the photon does not have enough energy to eject an electron. Now, if the photon does have more energy than the work function, then it can eject an electron. And if the photon has more energy than the work function, then that extra energy goes into the kinetic energy of an ejected electron. And if you increase the intensity of the light, all that happens is you eject more electrons. But if you're below that frequency, if your photons have too little energy, increasing the intensity will not eject any electrons. If you're below that threshold frequency, each photon has too little energy to eject any electrons. Sending in more of them, in other words, increasing the intensity, sending in more of these low energy photons will not eject any more electrons, will not eject any electrons, in fact. So let's think about three different situations. Let's think about a situation where you're sending in photons which have energy less than the work function. If you do that, these photons have too little energy to eject any electrons from the metal. So no matter how many of these photons you send in, 
you could send in huge amounts of these photons, but none of them have enough energy to eject any electrons. So you don't get any electrons ejected in this situation. Now let's think of a situation where you send in photons where they have energy equal to the work function. So if you have that situation, then the light is made up of these photons with the threshold energy of the metal, and the photons provide just enough energy to allow the electrons to escape. But they escape without any extra kinetic energy. So they just escape, and they don't have any extra motion. Now, if you send in a photon with more energy than the work function, then the light has a frequency greater than that threshold frequency, and the photons have more than enough energy to eject the electrons from the metal. So each photon that goes in is able to eject an electron and provide that electron with additional kinetic energy. So the electron, every electron escapes with extra kinetic energy. Now, this explanation was very, very useful because it explained what was observed. And it explained what was observed, whereas the old idea, the classical idea, did not. But the controversial idea behind this is that we have to think of light as being particles, as being photons, instead of waves, electromagnetic waves. So that was controversial at the time, but it was the only explanation that would describe and explain the observations. Now, this equation right here can explain or can describe what is seen. Here we have E max is equal to HF minus the work function. E max is the maximum energy of an ejected electron. HF, that's the incoming energy of the photon. And phi is the work function of the metal. That's the energy needed to eject an electron from the metal. So we can use this to create a graph. So we'll have a graph of the maximum energy of the ejected electrons versus the frequency of the light being sent in to the metal. And if you do this, you get a graph that looks like that. Now, this graph is described by that equation up there. If you compare this to y equals mx plus b, then the slope of this line has to be Planck's constant. And the y-intercept, if you were to extend it, would be the negative of the work function. Let's move on to electron diffraction. So imagine a situation where you send in a bunch of electrons, and in practice what you do is you send it into a crystal with equally spaced atoms, leaving equally spaced apertures. So essentially, the crystal acts like a diffraction grating. If you do that, what is observed is not what was expected. What is observed is a diffraction pattern on a screen. Now, this is odd because electrons are particles. Um, we'd expect them to pass through the apertures like little bullets. We'd expect them to go through the empty spaces and not go through the filled spaces, and they would just go in a straight line hit the screen and make a dot. Instead, what is observed is a diffraction pattern. The electrons in this situation do not behave like particles. Instead, they diffract. The electrons behave like waves. And in fact, the electrons behave like waves with a given wavelength. And that wavelength is called the de Broglie wavelength. And it's given by this equation. Lambda is equal to h over p, where h is Planck's constant, and p is the momentum of the electron, or whatever particle we're looking at. So that's odd, because electrons, which we think of as being particles normally, here are acting like waves. So what's the connection between the photoelectric effect and the diffraction of electrons? Well, the photoelectric effect suggests that light, which we have been thinking of as a wave, can behave like particles. And the diffraction of electrons suggests that electrons, which we normally think of as particles, 
can behave like waves. And this brings us to the concept of wave-particle duality. We think of light as a wave, and we think of electrons as particles. That's the way that we've gone through physics so far. But in reality, they're neither one. A wave and a particle, those ideas, those are models that we use to think of things. And they're only as useful as they work, as they explain observations. The model of a wave and the model of a particle sometimes explains the observations and sometimes it doesn't. Neither the wave model nor the particle model is perfect, so we need a better model. And that better model is wave-particle duality. Sometimes it works to think of light as being a wave, and sometimes it makes sense or explains the observations to think of light as being like a particle. And sometimes it works and it explains the observations to think of electrons as particles. And sometimes it explains the observations to think of electrons as waves. That's the idea behind wave-particle duality.